And he was so worried about you that he didn't even want to call you. Didn't even want, he didn't want to tell anybody. Right. So it, it was one of those deals where, um, I kind of coached him through it in a weird way. And, and I was obviously I'm younger than him. It was really strange how that all kind of went through and I didn't realize how much that he really leaned on me for advice and stuff like that. So, um, What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Face and Nation podcast. You are here. My name is CJ Face, and I'm here with co-host Chris Baird. And then we also, we've got, well, we, we've got a pretty special guest. What, I mean, wouldn't you say? Or Probably the just... most special, yeah, I think. No. <laughs> he said no. <laughs> I don't know. This man's pretty wild. <laughs> so for everybody watching, this is my grandfather, Ron Sr. And uh, this is a guy who has been put through more in his life than anyone that I know, and mainly because of his grandson, Um You've you owe me. No, yeah, I, do, I owe you. You're, That's right. Yeah, well, you're the reason he's bald. I know, and then I'm the reason I'm bald. So it's like, yeah. hey, uh, real quick before we get into this podcast, so like on a serious note, I just want to thank you for uh, the male pattern baldness that I have. That's why I look like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a good job with that one. Yeah, two well, for two. Listen, this applies to men only. Hair and brains don't grow in the same place on men. <laughs> <laughs> I can believe that. <laughs> Just it's messed up. That. No, I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. So, yeah, thank you for the uh, the hair loss because I had, like, the widow's peak working back, and I'm like, you know what? I'm just shaving it. So. Horns. You can see the horns. Yeah. So, Granddad, um, I'm interested to interview you, and, and mainly because you have such a, a dynamic story, right? I mean, everything that you've been through from growing up to now, all of it, it intrigues me to no end, right? I look up to you a lot and I love some of the way that you do things. Um, a lot of ways that he does things are sometimes unorthodox. And I like that because we need yes. that in life. You know, we've lost that from, you know, the previous generation. I would never want it to be normal. <laughs> See where I get it from? <laughs> Everybody can be normal. I won't be different. <laughs> you have accomplished that. Yeah, you do I a great job. I you that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you've, you've, trust me, you, you've got that covered. Okay. So let's talk about something. Um, you have some military background. Yes. Uh, fill us, give us like a brief history of, of what you did and, and what made Ron Sr. Ron Sr. early in life. I want to know that. There's a lot of stuff I don't know, but there's a lot of stuff I do know too. So You want to start when I was born and work up or just... From the military. I, I want to know about the military. That intrigues me because I think that's where, like, you and I, like, you know, we we, we love our, you know, Second Amendment. So, uh, right. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, tell me a little bit about that. We're, we're, you know, in the military. Give us that Give us that story there. Well, 1955, I joined the Reserves. And uh, back then, it was a different world military-wise anyway. And... Uh, I transferred to two or three different groups. I, w I was working with computers at the time, and I joined the reserve that had the computers. Worked on that, and then I transferred to uh, the Army Reserve from the National Guard to the Army Reserve because it was a truck driving thing, and they had they were doing away with the computer section in the National Guard. Gotcha. So I uh, grew up in that one. That's where I was in the reserve. And then uh, <clears throat> I was in there about 12 years. And then that's after you after you got out of the military, that's when you went to work for IBM. No, right? no, no, I never worked. I, or not IBM, I'm sorry, the computer place. Computers, IBM equipment. Okay, gotcha, I gotcha. was the guy that made the computer do what IBM salesman promised my boss it would do. <laughs> <laughs> it's called the fixer. Yes. That, that was, and a lot of times that was a chore that was almost impossible. 
Gotcha. <laughs> Does it, let me ask you this. Does it surprise you from like back then in like the computer world up to now? Does it surprise you where we're at now? Or did you, did you back then think, wow, this computer could probably, you know, be artificial intelligence one day. Did you ever have that inkling? Like, wow, this is going to be big or just like, what was that? No, I, I was concentrating on making it do what the salesman told me. Gotcha. So the salesman, basically, it sounds like he would oversell and underdeliver, and then he had to overdeliver. <laughs> so this uh, computer's going to do your dishes and take your wife to dinner tonight, and uh, he's got to make it do all that fun stuff. Well, that pretty much does that now. You can order your wife flowers online and DoorDash, anything these days. Yeah, so thanks for your contributions there, I guess, right? Yeah, do we owe him? Yeah, <laughs> like we do owe you, granddad. Some gratitude? Well, well back in 1956, Oh, uh, see, in 1955, I was still in high school. Got 1956, it. 1956, okay. I graduated. And uh, a little background on my married life. I was uh, going steady with your grandmother when I was 15. Wow. Damn. Engaged to her when I was 17. And, and we got married when I was 18. Wow. What, what would be the best play and you were married 53 years right 54 54 years that's awesome it's a long time you don't see that these days you see well, everybody kind of jumping off the ships and bandwagon after they get married well when you get the right one you're all right i would agree I, with I, that. I was very lucky do you think that today i mean you you get to see it all the time do you think today people jump into things wanting the right person and like you in your head like See, back in the day, you all didn't have social media, right? And <laughs> <laughs> that's a far didn't cry. Have television either until, <laughs> until 1948. Right. <laughs> so you got to think about this. I mean, looking back, if you all had social media, how much different would marriages be and stuff? It, it, you can, you, it's just how the world has changed and evolved, right? But like you and Mimi, the, you two were inseparable. I mean, she was the glue that held the family together. I mean, I think yes. we can all admit Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yes. so, so I guess I want to kind of go into this. You spent 54 years of marriage. Okay. So what would that be total? That would be like, you were almost there together for what? 57. 50, 57 years together with one person consistent all the time. Every day. Every day you were together. Right. And you two were a team. So let me ask you questions about that. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable talking about this, it's completely fine. But like, okay. I like knowing some of, uh, the good things and the bad things. Right. And the, the good times you could write probably 50 books about. Right. True. But the story that intrigues me the most is when, um, Mimi was diagnosed with cancer, right? Yeah. Yeah. She fought it for, if I'm correct, eight years. Six and a half years. Six and a half years. And it was, she was young when, or I was young when, you know, she was diagnosed. So to me, it was like the first time I had ever heard of cancer. I, I, you know, I was young. You didn't really know what that was about, but, um, I'll never forget that every day and, and maybe you didn't even know this, but, uh, when I got a little bit older, you know, dad, he would tell me, he said, you know, every time that, you know, your grandfather would call me, I'd have a pit in my stomach. Because he didn't know if it was the phone call that was that's true that was dreaded. I didn't realize that at the time either. So every time you called, he had a pit in his stomach, and I just want to know, like you, you did so much for Mimi. You were there for her. Like, was when you were in the moment of all of that cancer, were you kind of night na not naive, but were you in denial about it any? Because you were like, we can beat this, or did you know that, unfortunately, one day that time would come? When she when she was diagnosed with four can, uh, stage four cancer, the doctor told her it was not curable. Not curable for her. Wow. So for six and a half years, she lived to, with that in mind that hey, I'm not going to get out of this. And she knew that she had that mindset. That's what yeah. that's what doesn't make sense to me is that she was. So positive still. Oh, yeah. She mm -hmm. always smiling. I never saw her that she was down in the dumps no, or feeling she, sorry for herself or anything. She wasn't that way when she was with me at all. Wow. She Especially in other people, but 
When we were home alone, she was she was a, a positive. So even when the family wasn't there <clears throat> and it was just you and her, she was still positive, upbeat, happy, and smiling. Yes. And when she was diagnosed, like what, like what? How did that change your guys' dynamic and like life? Like what did you guys do differently? Like how did like how did that change things? Anything she wanted, she got. That's good. It's yeah. awesome. We go to the shop and she said, "I need a I need a new outfit." She, her weight kept changing, so we go. She said, "I don't want you to go in. You sit in the car." I said, I'm going in with you. She says, no, you won't, because all you do is buy more. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> so you took so, good care of her. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I went in and several times, and I remember we, we used to go down to uh, Florida, January, February, March, and just when it was warm. And uh, she says, I need a new outfit. And I said, okay, let's go. So we went in there, and. <clears throat> she picked out about four different ones. She, she looked at me and said, now, which one you like the best? I said, I like this one right here, but it looks better on you. She said, okay. She turned to the sales lady and said, we'll take this one. And I, and I said, we'll take them all. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. But, well, if it hadn't been for her, wouldn't have anything. Was she the the rock of your life that kept yes. you in order and kept me wanting to keep going? That's and, awesome. And the biggest, the hardest problem about uh, a spouse that has his wife has cancer is nothing you can do to help. Nothing. Just be there, right? I was there. You were there for every treatment. You were there for yeah, she every had, appointment. She, she had uh, six and a half years chemo and 72 radiation treatments. Good grief. I was there for a whole long. And that's got to be tough at some points, you know what I mean? Um, well, she, she, she realized things. Were, she wasn't dumb. She was a smart lady. She picked me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I love no, it. No, it, it was, <laughs> See where I get this from? Hundred <laughs> percent. This is all leggy right here. It was all the way around. I feel very fortunate. But anyway, <laughs> she, she was, I didn't expect that. And she took after her father. She loved to tease. Oh, trust me, I know. Oh, there, that pieces are coming together, folks. Yeah, I know. Everything that made me is like coming right down the line. How did? Yeah. Well, she looked at me one day and said, "I don't know what I'd do without you." I said, you'll never find out. <laughs> That's deep. Yeah. How did how did you know? I mean, you guys, you said you met and got together when you were 15, but, like, how, how did you know back then that she was the one? Well, it was uh, just a feeling I had. I was sitting in French class one day, and when the junior senior banquet was coming up, I was a junior, she was a senior. Nice. <clears throat> Older lady. Hey. Anyway, I I asked my French teacher, I said, I, I want to go ask uh, Lucy to go with me to the junior senior. Well, and I had to, and, and the French teacher said, well, go ahead. So I interrupted the senior English singer class. Teacher came to the I said, I need to talk to Lucy. She turned around and said, Lucy, somebody wants to see you. I come out and I said, I like i like to take you to the junior senior banquet. And at the time, she was dating somebody else. Steady. And he was in service. And so she thought, well, going with him would be better than going with a bunch of girls. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what she said later. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe nervous. Like, if she said no, I'm like, damn, I'm not even going to be here. This is weird. It's a big decision. It's weird looking back at this. Yeah. Like, like that one decision could have, like, altered everything. Well, I say she was going steady. She was dating the guy in the Navy. She, they weren't really steady or engaged. Or anything. Yeah. But anyway, she says, yeah, I'll go. So, I, and then... The feeling came over me that uh, you know that you have when you think you know you know you did something right. Yeah, it, it was that like um, what is it? It's a, is it a type of feeling where because you hear people all the time? 
you know, what probably ruins it for me is like the social media quotes. You know, you're on Facebook. You see it all the time. Like people share like, when you know, you know. And, you know, dad used to tell me that. He's like, you know, when you know, you know. And you've said that to me before, too. And me being me, I'm just like, get out of here with that shit. I'm just, I'm good. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? And, you know, life has clearly changed for me, as you know. And is that feeling... Is it an instant one or is it like a progressive one that just got stronger? Or did you like, yep, I know this is it. Well, I, I thought, I, I, like you said, I thought it was it. But as the, as the years go on, it gets better. And that's how you know, right? So it's growing, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Never huh. got bored or sick of each other. It just yeah. gets fonder and fonder. That's rare. I mean, that's rare. Like, you know, you, you you see it. We live in social media land where the next best slice of pie is right there on your Instagram feed or on your Facebook feed. And this girl posting pictures in a bikini and all that. And that's fine. I'm not hating on that. But, like, you all didn't have that back in the day. You know, no, you, you, no one knew what, you know, as weird as this is, no one knew what, you know, Lucy looked like in a bathing suit. But, unfortunately, well, everyone knows what everyone looks like in a bathing suit these days. It's not well, as, like, sacred. Back then, you know? there were no bikini, bikinis. They were all solid suits from here. Oh down with a little skirt on it got it okay so that that love was real then because you didn't have no inkling what was going on you're just like yeah personality like mattered way more and Imagine. wasn't just what you look like yeah in 40 years are gonna have stickers <laughs> like it's just progressively gotten less and less <laughs> it's little circles you know what i mean <laughs> but uh, like what's but she wouldn't have worn a bikini to start with exactly yep understandable that's the way that's the way we were brought up What's um? And that has a lot to do with the way they change. Absolutely, the changes. Parents today, in my opinion, don't really teach their children. They throw money at them and let them get out of their, out of their hair. Right. Oh, hair in hair, so. <laughs> that makes but, sense. But I know uh, people start work right out of high school have no concept of what work is. Correct. Because they haven't been taught to work. I grew up on a farm. We get up at 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning, and we raise tobacco, corn, a bunch of other stuff. But at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning during the season, and we go to bed at night about 10 o'clock. You worked all day? I started working when I was 6 years old. I was driving a mule and a tobacco sled. That was my job. Wow. Wow. Carried, carried the tobacco from the field to the barn where the, where the ladies were tied and put it, we put it in the barn later on. Hmm. So. Uh, and I, and then I was driving at, at seven and a half, somewhere between seven and a half and eight years old, I was driving a tractor. Crazy. Now, I learned that we were taught how to work. Right. Closest thing kids and today know the tractors, tractor simulator, and their iPads. You know, kids eight years old driving tractors today. Nah. <laughs> Less than one percent of one percent. Yeah. yeah. What, what would you? So you know, um, you all obviously you and Mimi had Aunt Rhonda. She's the oldest, right? Right. And then you had Dad, right. and that was your only two kids. Yes. And what was? So them growing up, you made them work. Oh, yeah. You made them work. And then, oh, obviously, yeah. you know, the steel hammer that fell on Dad fell on me. I don't know what you did to him, but, like, I thought we were bonding every time that we would, like, you know, he was making me work in, like, the most crazy conditions. So, like, is that something that you did to him? Yes. Like, always had them working? Because, like, both of them are, or, you know, Dad was a hustler, but, well, you know. Well, I worked with computers for a while, and then we went in the restaurant business. And that's right. Your dad was like seven or eight years old when we were in the restaurant, and he was cleaning tables. For the bar That's towel. awesome. And he, I can see him now. He'd take that bar towel and swing it like this while he's waiting for somebody to get off the table. <laughs> and, and then we went, <clears throat> went into the auction business, and uh, he was about 15, I think, or 14, 15. And I'd say, okay, son, bring out the refrigerator. <laughs> he put it on a hand truck, roll it right out, and we'd sell it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so 
yeah. had him working from an early age. I mean, you kind of have to these days. You now, know. And, and your aunt, Rhonda, same way. She, yeah. She was there working. That's good stuff. I mean, you got, so I would say looking at a, a, a man like yourself, you've lived a very full life. You yep. had two wonderful kids. I mean, both of them. I mean, dad, he was successful. Aunt Rhonda is very successful. Yeah. Um, you yourself, you were very successful. And but the biggest part is our grandchildren are more successful than I was ever. Can we? You get that grandchildren. Exactly. So they were taught work they were taught very well i don't think the apple fell far from the tree <laughs> starting at the top but like also i i mean it, unfortunately there's people out there and you know you always go to bat for me but like for me and my cousins on you know our side of the family we were never given anything regardless of what people think it's easy to look at me or you know whitney or Lindsay and be like oh yeah they were given something when we all we, I mean, I, I remember a story that Uncle Larry, uh, I guess Whitney came home drunk one time when she was like 19 and he was pissed, remember? And she was hung over the next day and then he made her go out and do yard work in 100 degree weather all day long the next day, no water. <laughs> Just like, if you're going to do something bad, you're going to have some consequences and that's that, a thing. That's another thing. Parents today aren't teaching their children the consequences of their actions. Correct. They don't do that. They go, that's, the, that's the reason you have a lot of these shootings and all that stuff. Back when I was in school, we I would be I I was one of them, and I would be the guy that would drive the farm truck there. We had the rifles rack behind you, right? Park it all day, come back home, go home. Mm-hmm. So the guns were just at school at in my age, but I knew. How to handle one, and I knew what I was supposed not to do. Bingo. You, well, you knew mother, there was consequences my, back then. Well, my mother and, and father both told me, you get a whipping in school, you're going to get a low when you get home. Amen to that. And they did it. Yep. I didn't tell them at all of them. But it, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. But, like, let's let's go through, like, the, the hard work thing, right? I mean, somebody can... Somebody can look at any of us or, you know, even dad and be like, oh, it was handed down from you. And then it was from you to me. I mean, truthfully, you you never gave dad a dime. You never gave me a dime. Dad never gave me a dime. It was always like it. You kind of like if I have to say this and I got to commend you for it because I look at some of my friends and, and stuff and I'm like, man, like there's this one kid that I went to high school with that I'm like, what the hell? Like his parents gave him everything and oh, yeah. he, he's turned out to be a loose cannon. Like true loose cannon. Like, exactly. I mean, if I ever saw him in public, I'd, I'd avoid him type of thing. But like you never gave anybody anything and it just kind of trickled down. Yeah. What what was you your work ethic you passed along? And it went for generations, basically. I'm glad. Yeah, me I'm too. I'm glad. <laughs> and, and I'll say this, all of my grandchildren were more bo- better financially than I was ever. They're smarter, they know how to work, and they don't mind doing it. Right. That's right. Yeah, we don't we don't mind the hard work. We've only known that. But again, and it started from you. It went to dad and it went to Aunt Rhonda and it went to us kids. Well it really and no started, one deviated. it really started from my dad because he used to sign me jobs to do on the farm while and then he had like he had to go get fertilizer and stuff like that. And he Yeah. He said, okay, I'm going to get some fertilizer, and I want you to do this, this, and this, and you and the other people that work there on the farm. And then he looked at me and said, and while you're resting, you can go over here and do this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> what was what was one of, so growing up, you were raising dad, you are raising Aunt Rhonda. What was one, what's one story that sticks out to you about dad that you're like, Man, that was funny, or that was stupid, or what? What's one story that just sticks out above all the rest about Dad? Well, I'm, well, both of them together, I'm very proud of because they, they turned out to be great people. Absolutely, they did. Yep. Yep. That's that's the top of the line when you realize your children are good kids. Yeah, it's got to feel good. Yep. 
makes you feel like, hey, maybe I did something right. Yeah. And you did. 100%. <clears throat> so what's that one story that sticks out about dad that you, good, bad, indifferent, <laughs> what's something that would, that would sticks out to you? Well, I've said this many times. You're not supposed to leave with children. Right. Yeah. That's what sticks out. Yeah. No, I, I understand that. And and does do you think that affects you a little bit more than than Mimi? You know what I mean? That when dad when dad was diagnosed versus Mimi, was it was it like more of a shock to you, or what was that? More of the same. More of the same. Gotcha. That was um. I do I do want to touch on something. So, um, dad was in the hospital after the whole accident at the racetrack and, and they scanned his body and they came into the room and they said, um, they said, uh, Hey, you, you, we've got a, a mass or like a lump somewhere or whatever. We need to get it checked out. So, uh, we get dad out of the hospital. He's got, you know, that broken hip and all that, that he had. And we go home and him and I, we talk and we're like, Hey, we're, we got to get this checked out. So, you, you know, him and I are the king of whatever's wrong with us. We're tough as nails. We'll get through it. We're not worried about it. Him and I both. And I think that comes from you and we thank you for that. But we also, it's a bad trait too. So we um, go a couple weeks and we didn't go to that appointment to follow up with it. And then, you know, three or four months go by and then we went to Busco Beach and I talked him into buying a brand new four seater side by side. He wasn't on that thing. If it was eight minutes, I'm lying to you. Within six minutes, he dislocated his shoulder and tore his rotator cuff. And it, it like, it f***ed him up. Like, he, he was like a gimped arm and all this. So, he was, like, driving the rest of the weekend like this in pure oh. pain. So, um, anyway, we get back home and he had to go get it checked out. So, obviously, like, yeah, you got a torn rotator cuff. We can't do surgery because you got some kind of lump. They did test. Well, dad uh, went and got the biopsy done. And then you got to wait for the results. So the results come back about, a, I guess, a week or two later. And he calls me and he said, I want you to go with me. I said, all right. So we go to the the place in Seaford there and we go up in there and the lady's like, yep, this is cancer. This is stage four. It's in your colon and it's around your liver and all of this. And I'm just like, I'm sitting there thinking it was just like a tumor that they could go in there and like cut out. But when they said the word cancer in colon cancer, Stage four. Stage four. That's the last stage. Yeah. I was, I can truly tell you all that I was just like, I was blown away. I I didn't quite understand. I understood the severity, but me being me, knowing that I can fix anything in the world except for this, I was like, I didn't know what to think. So we got to the truck. Uh, We got back down to the truck and we got in and he said, uh, one, one of the things that, stood out to me he was like don't tell granddad yet and I'm like okay Um, because he had this order in his head that he wanted to tell everyone and I think he knew that you you would probably you know take it the harshest of you know it, it would it would affect you the most so I told him I said hey listen I said you know I if it were me in your shoes the first person that I would call would be my dad and I would be like Let's devise a plan of how to tell everyone appropriately. And he was so worried about you that he didn't even want to call you. Didn't even want, he didn't want to tell anybody, right? So it, it was one of those deals where um, I kind of coached him through it in a weird way. And, and I was obviously I'm younger than him. It was really strange how that all kind of went through. And I didn't realize how much that he really leaned on me for advice and stuff like that. So, um, I said, listen, I'm not going to say anything to anybody, but you you eventually do have to tell people. It's only fair. So, yeah, I, I don't know how he ever told you or how you ever heard. Maybe it was through Aunt Rhonda, but, like, he was deathly just sick to his stomach to tell you just because you went through six years with Mimi, you know? And he doesn't – he didn't want you to relive another six years with him like that. So, um yeah, he, he cared dearly about how you were going to take it. And well, that, was, that was a big concern for him. Yeah. Uh, well, I can understand that and I appreciate it. Uh, he told Rhonda. 
Mm-hmm. And Rhonda told her kids. Yep. And she called me and says, uh, I need to come talk to you. And she's the one who eventually told you. Gotcha. I mean, and it's it's definitely not not easy for anyone. No. Um, the diagnosis was uh, when I was sitting there in the office. Um, the you know the the cancer doctor said, "Do you want to know what we think timeline wise?" And dad's dad looked at me and I said, "That's up to you," because I I, t- I looked at him and I said, "We're going to live every single day like tomorrow is literally your last day." Right. And he said, "Well." He said, give me a time frame so I can beat it. And I'm like, all right, that's a true <laughs> facing statement if I've ever f-ing heard one. Yeah. <laughs> Just <laughs> give me a timeline so I can beat it. I'm like, all right, well. <laughs> so he did that. You know, he's like, I want to know. And she's like, six months without treatment, eight to 10 with treatment. He said, cool, I'll see you in over a year. <laughs> so sure enough, <laughs> we, um, he went and got that port put in, you know, or port over here, like around his heart. So it like pumps the chemo through your heart or something. I don't understand how that all it's, went. No, it has to keep from having used veins. Oh, okay. You that f- would make it's, sense. It's easier. You just stick the Stick it right in that and thing. And that goes. Got it. So um, that basically was the, one of the weirdest things ever. You know, he had to get this thing put in and all that. And, uh, that's when I started to realize, oh, oh shit, this, this is real. And I went to, I was kind of similar to you and Mimi. I went to every single chemo appointment he had, except for two. One, um, little Brittany went with, and then another one, um, our buddy Shannon Morris, he went with dad and sat with him through that. And he was good friends with dad and I. Well, yeah, your friends always want to help. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was one of the, the weirdest things that you sat through there and, you know, dad, he was a very optimistic person and he all the time was again, continually worried about two people through this whole spectacle. Um, number one, he was worried about telling you cause he didn't know how this would affect your, you know, your mental state. You just went through this with Mimi. Now he's got the same thing and how all that would transpire. So he was really worried about that. And then he was worried about the way that I would take it. And, um, you know, I think it says a lot that he was worried about the, the, the two toughest people in the family, you know, because there's, we've got these walls built up, but you know, sometimes it is, it is tough, you know? Yeah. And well, uh, the bad part is you can't help it. Correct. Can't do anything to change what's going on. What, what and, would, and I, I, uh, I remember, uh, Lucy was, and I were discussing things, and I was a little upset. And, I, and she said, well, why are you so upset? I said, because I can't do a damn thing to help you. Yeah, and that hurts. Definitely, definitely hurts. Nothing you can do to change. No. Um, By the way, you like to comment on your at when you when you passed away, you did. Mm-hmm. I was very proud of you. You do you handle that excellent. Like in the hospital room, yeah, that was a that was a that was the that was the weirdest moment of my life. I don't I don't know if I ever told you that or not. Yeah, it was a uh, we were all standing around Dad's bed, and he's got this tube down his throat, and he could squeeze your hand. He he knew you were there, but you know, obviously, it wasn't like communication. And uh, <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I held his hand, and all of a sudden, it like. It was like an out-of-body experience. I've never experienced anything like this in my life. But it was like he talked through me to every individual person. It was the weirdest fucking thing ever. Weirdest thing ever. It's crazy. It was weird because I was like, I've said words I've never said before. And he. Yeah. it was like he spoke to everyone in that room through me. And it's just a weird experience. But I, th- I feel like we're all crazy. connected in some way. Yeah. I mean, get spiritual. Like there's all, there's something there. Yeah, you know? yeah. He, you made it to the hospital, what maybe an hour or two before? No, probably about thirty four to five minutes before he died. Gotcha. And uh, kind of reminded uh, reminded all of us of Mimi's situation. She was yeah. she was waiting on me to get there. I was the last grandchild to to be there, 
and and she wouldn't go. Like they kept it's, giving her morphine. Like it's almost like they know or something like that. Yeah, they just want everyone to be together when it happens. Yeah, it's really really strange how that worked. I mean, the same thing happened for Dad. I mean, he was he wouldn't go. Like we were all standing there around the bed. I said, you know, all the stuff that I guess he wanted me to say. And after yeah. that, he he would not go. He just kept hanging on, hanging on, hanging on. The nurse came in, and she's like, "I'm not really sure, you know, what's going on." Yeah. And then uh, that's when I, when I, uh, called. I, you called your mother and told her to get me down there. Yeah. I was up at the old chimney. Yep. So we uh we were all we all went to the hospital. We're all standing around that hospital bed, and he he wouldn't go. And all of a sudden, I, I'm telling you, it's the weirdest thing ever, but. When I leaned down, I kissed him on the forehead, and, uh, you know, the one that he was worried about the most was me, mm-hmm. uh, how I would take it. I just leaned down, and I was like, you know, Dad, I'm going to be all right, and it's okay to let go. And it wasn't two f-ing seconds later, yeah. gone. You need to Weird as fuck. Weird. Yeah. You just want to make sure. It's like he needed that confirmation. A lot of, a lot of families go through the same thing. They keep hanging on and hanging on, and then when things are right, they decide to go. Yeah. Wow, doesn't it? Yep. Sweet connection. I've had, like, family members say that they've, like, seen the person, like, afterwards walking out, like, just, like, I'm okay. Like, it's just, it's just like, everyone has a different experience, but wow. it's really... It's unique. It is. Every experience is, is very unique. There's, there's probably more to say um, just about dad you know what i mean he was <laughs> he was a very dynamic individual oh yeah he was um best business person i ever knew oh yeah best business person i ever knew i mean he was sharp really really sharp and that's um and it all relates back to the restaurant industry i mean you all were running restaurants back then and had a ton going on the auction business and then yep. coming up here with this auction and it was just like it's crazy to look back at life and and see where all of it started and where all of it is right now. <laughs> yeah. It's um pretty incredible. What's one of the most proud moments that you had of dad? Like what's something that you're like, damn, I'm proud of him after he did that? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of them. A lot of I and I told him that every, every time I talked to him, hardly most of the time. Anyway, him and Rhonda both of them. And I even tell you that. I, I you, you've told you, me more than dad has, but it's okay. And hey, well, he, he he didn't. He was kind of withdrawn on personal things, and he didn't praise you. He he knew it and was happy about it, but he just didn't say things like that. Yeah. And I I uh, I like I enjoyed saying, "Hey, I'm proud of you." Yeah, you you tell me a lot. <laughs> You've probably told me more in one month than he did his whole life. <laughs> Well, that's the reason I explained. He he just wasn't didn't want to. Well, he, you're his son, see, so he may have wanted to say it, say it a lot. But if he figures if he said too much, then you might not go that way no more. So. Yeah, might get to my head. Yeah, makes the moments he did say it mean more to you too. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you yeah. know, of course, I tell him I'm proud of him. Yeah, I told him that many a time because, like you said, he was a very smart. Businessman, very and a great human being. Yeah, what? Yeah, what, what's one of your guys is like? Both of you, like, just like fa- it's just favorite things ever that's ever happened. He did like best stories of of him. So you guys doing stuff together? Anything that sticks out for? There's a lot. I think one that sticks out for me, <laughs> probably the most, more than anything, was uh, this one time. Or like he w- he would do this all the time. He was the I guess like uh, just kind of like a silent giver. Like he gave all the time. Like oh, he would yeah. go, like if he was at the Del Mar racetrack, he would go to this Snooky speed shop. Like they were the part supplier there. Mm-hmm. And he would give like, you know, four or $500 to the, to Snooky and be like, Hey man, when this guy over here comes up for tires, just give them to him and don't tell him who it's from. And, exactly. and, and he would do that stuff all the time. Like he yeah. would go to those like, um, there's charity dinners and he would spend, you know, six, eight, ten thousand dollars sometimes a night just giving back. Like he gave like I mean, he out give he out gave anyone that I know. And yeah. and he didn't ask for credit for it. He didn't ask for didn't anything. Want, didn't want nobody to know it. He didn't want anybody to know it. 
Yeah. He would rather it go under the rug and not get praised for it other than, you know, he just wasn't like the public type of person when, when he gave, you know, yeah. uh, it, it, it's good and it's bad. It, it, you know, there's two ways to look at it, you know, and, well, and he loved being that silent giver. He loved well, that. You know, he, he was looking at the homework ball finally. Mm-hmm. And he, he said to me, hey, I don't really want, I'd like to have it, but I don't really want it because it's a kind of a show-off thing. And I don't want people to think that. Mm-hmm. I said, hey, if you want it, get it. Exactly. You work hard for it. Yeah. yeah. I told him, I said, go get the thing. And he fought, well, he waited and waited and waited. And I called him, <laughs> I said, you get it yet? <laughs> And I was, uh, I just really hadn't decided I really want to do that. I said, well, I think you ought to do it now. And anyway, we got it. <laughs> Tim. Yeah. Well, you, you work for things that you want to have or give or whatever. That's where you work. Right. So. Yeah. What's, um, what, what's, well, well, let me ask you this, kind of lighten it up a little bit here. Which one of your most fond memories of you and I? What, what's something that's just like stands out over the rest? <laughs> Whether it's like the crazy shit I used to prank you with. God, this, uh, this could me, go two different ways. The it's ones, my turn. Let me tell the ones listening now that this guy, <clears throat> he, he would call up and he had some device so he could change it from telephone number so i i look i said i don't know who that is and i answer it and then he pulled these pranks on me he did that for years and i told him i said one of these days i'm gonna get even with you well that day still hadn't come so. i'm always looking over my shoulder just in case well he called up one night and he said i'm your next door neighbor well i thought he lives way away from where i live <laughs> They live in the country. Like he's like a quarter mile away. <laughs> he says, Your dog is getting my newspaper and I don't know what he's doing with it, but he's just taking my newspaper every day. I said he's I said, Your dog's taking my newspaper every damn day. <laughs> I'ma come down there and whip your ass. <laughs> and I I told him, I said, Hey, come on. <laughs> and I said, I don't I didn't know it was him. <laughs> I so, said, come on, I don't even have a dog. <laughs> and then and then before he hangs up, he said, matter of fact, I'll meet you halfway across that field. <laughs> so, oh, no. And then he hangs up, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> I'm like, he's like, I'm gonna, he's going to like go shoot the neighbor or something. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> so I called him. I'm like, it's me, it's me, it's me. It's a prank. It's a prank. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, oh, man. That is brutal. Yeah, he called up one day knowing I was leaving for Florida the next day in the motorhome, January, going down there with Mimi. And he says, there's been a recall on something, some part of your motorhome, and you need to get it in the shop tomorrow. Or we're going to void the warranty on your <laughs> brand new motorhome. <laughs> yeah, go void the warranty. I didn't know it was him. I started letting him have it. <laughs> Good. Uh, good. <laughs> he, he was so pissed and then i'm like sir let me put you on hold real quick i was like Boom. <laughs> and then i hear him in the background they're gonna void my damn warranty on this thing if i don't get it in there tomorrow i ain't going tomorrow i'm going to florida I'm, i can't hear all this so i unmute my phone i'm like sir are you still there yeah i'm here <laughs> all right sir well you know and, and then i you talk to your boss <laughs> <laughs> yep. I talked to my boss, and he said that we're very sorry for the inconvenience. You can bring it back in after you get back home from Florida. We're going to do a complimentary oil change on your motor home, the generator. We're going to rotate your tires. We're going to do a 193-point inspection. And he didn't know this, but, like, I'm trying to throw out things. Like, I'm born on August 31st of 93, so I said 193 point inspection uh, i said you know as long as you get in here before august 31st and all this and he still ain't picking up on it because i've changed my voice and like i'm really good at changing august voices. 31st is somebody's birthday <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and he ain't picking up on it's in january right now <laughs> so i went from giving him one day to get it in <laughs> to eight giving months, him eight months, months. <laughs> so then <laughs> i'm like oh sir hang on one second let me put you back on hold I put this fool back on hold again, and I had to collect myself. I'm dying inside to laugh. I wanted to laugh so bad. So I came back. I said, sir, my boss just let me know we're going to put a brand new gas grill 
in the slide out compartment of your motorhome. He said, Oh, thank you, thank you. Oh my god, thank you. Thank you. So he's this, this is just <laughs> one of many. <laughs> There's one I want to talk about, but I don't know if, if you oh, want to get got, fired up. It got so if I didn't know the telephone number, I didn't answer the phone. Smart. How many phone calls did you miss that were actually real? I don't tell. <laughs> can, can you please tell the one with the credit card, please? Huh? I thought I heard. Something. I think it was when oh, I did this. Okay. Yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> so, can you please tell that one? People need to hear this story. Yeah, maybe one day. No, <laughs> maybe one day. Oh, uh, it's the best one I've ever heard. He's. He gets amped up on this one. What's what's another time that just a, a funny moment that you can remember? Remember when I, I turned the generator switch off on your motorhome at Bristol? Or did you ever know about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, boy. Remember when your generator quit working at Bristol? Yeah. <laughs> did you ever take that? They go, like, get it checked out? I'll get you for that, too, now. <laughs> That joke costs no, a thousand. It finally, evidently, you, you or somebody turned it back on because it started working again. <laughs> Convenient. You know how, like, the front end of your motorhome, it would, like, slide out, and then the, there was, like, an override switch? Yeah, in the generator. That's yeah. where the generator was. So, I don't know what he was mad about after the race. I mean, I finished fifth, so I'm in, like, prank mode. I go over there to his damn motorhome. I turn that thing off. He can't run his slides in. He can't do nothing. <laughs> Generator's useless. It's stuck. I had, a, I had a, a stick with the company still owns the American Eagle. Mm-hmm. It was 40 foot. It was a nice one. It was very nice. His his motor coach was, yeah, that thing is top of the line. That thing was so nice. That sounds so awesome. So nice. Man, they don't build them like they used to. No, that that thing was awesome. They traveled the country. Him and my grandmother, they traveled everywhere. That's awesome. Had a good time with that thing, though. Yeah. Yep. Question. Yeah. We were fixing to go to Kansas City to a auctioneer board meeting from the national, and uh, it's when the doctor called her while we were riding and told her she had cancer. Shoo. As you were driving out. And, and, uh, we were, were probably about well, 50, 100 miles away from home. Did and you turn said, around? Or? I said, hey, I'm turning around. We're going back. She says, no, we're going on. Wow. So we went out there. She didn't tell anybody. And I didn't tell anybody. She had a cancer. At the, at the meeting. And they were good friends. Shoo. That's when she found it was cancer. Jeez. That's tough. That's tough. Then she came back and uh, had an operation, and mm. she had a colostomy. Yeah, she had the bag, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you um, you took care of that the whole time, too. Oh, yeah. You didn't let anybody else touch it but you? Absolutely. The doctor put the first, it's a patch that you put on, mm-hmm. and then you put a bag on it. And you change the patch every so often. And we would go to meetings and all, and they were talking about they had rashes under it and all that stuff. So when the doctor put the first one on, and uh, a couple of weeks later we went back to see him, you didn't change the patch every day. You changed it, you know, periodically. Right. Anyway, she, they, he took the patch off and checked her, and she was okay. And if you get rash under there, you still got to use that same place. You yeah. can't move, you know. So he said to his nurse uh, to go ahead and put the patch on. I said, no, nobody puts some patches on but me. So, And the reason for that is I know how to sterilize your hands. You just put them in the hot water and don't take them out. Sure. So, till you just can't take it, and then you take them out, and then you get the patch, put it on there to keep from having a rash under there. Right. She <clears> never <throat> had one in six and a half years. Wow. wow. But her friends or, or that we learned to be friends with had the same things, and most of those would have 
or rashes and all the other stuff goes along with it. But <laughs> I saw you imagine that? Six and a half years. That shows your Gosh. trust in each other and the bond you guys had. That's it's a lot of trust. <clears throat> what are you guys like? What, what are some of your guys' like? I don't know, like favorite places to travel. Like, what did you and um, your wife like? What was your favorite stuff to do together? Just oh, we like to travel and eat. Eat different things, different places, and uh, certain places you like to go. Oh yeah, we jumped our our airplane and ride down, fly down from Raleigh to uh, Beaufort. On like after church on Sunday, eat lunch, sit around a while, and then fly back home. <laughs> That's so awesome. That's sick. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. I, I was funny thing. Uh, the, the one of the things that uh, really stands out about Ron. <clears throat> I, I, I took flying lessons. <laughs> You're going to like this one. <laughs> and I, and I bought, I bought uh, the plane that I was trying. I, in fact, I had three planes. Anyway, I, I told Ron one day, I said, come on, let me take you flying. He said, okay. So he comes over on his motorcycle to the little 1,800-foot uh, runway where you take off and land and so we he got in and I started down the run it was 1800 feet now you gotta get it in the air and get over the <laughs> not tree. a lot of time then and there's, a, the there's a big tree line down there yeah it was a it was a had, the <laughs> runway was down and it was a dirt road this way and a dirt road that way and you go up over the tree well, I got down, I got to going, and I probably didn't go over 30, 40 feet, and the, and the motor just started skipping. And I was, I was about probably 20 feet high. And when it did that, I thought, oh, I ain't going to make it over them trees. So <laughs> I, I hit the brakes, and then they realized that Brakes don't work unless it's on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> now, all this time, it probably takes three seconds to think of all this stuff. But anyway, I hit the nose down, and I, and I hit the left pedal on that th- on the brake so that when I hit, it'd go that way because I saw that road over that way. Mm-hmm. So. And so when it hit the ground, it would jump that way, and then bounced back up, and then I, I had some trees over there too. <laughs> so then I had to hit the right one, and when it hit, I pushed it down again, and it hit, and it turned right over that road, and it was about a six foot drop from where the runway was <laughs> to the road. <laughs> and so when I when I got there, I was still I pulled it up like this, so the nose uh, would be up, and and not not the front wheel. And when it bounced on the road, running right up there, and I stopped it. And by that time, they had my friends that were pilots. They they heard me start take off, and when I cut the motor, they heard that. And they knew I wasn't. I wasn't it good. It's not normal. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Something's wrong. Something's wrong. And they came running out. And we pushed it back up. Up the side road, down that thing, back, got it back in the hangar. And then it wasn't 30, 45 minutes, the uh, news people come out there, won't know. They heard they had a plane that, that had an emergency landing. We said, we don't know what to talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't see nothing. No idea. No <laughs> plan. Anyway, Ron was with me, and he says, I said, well, what do you think about all this? He said, well, I was thinking, Mom ain't going to let you buy another plane. Ain't <laughs> <laughs> that the truth? <laughs> We're and, done. Then, and then several several <laughs> months later, now, it didn't didn't hurt the plane. That cut pine trees down by the little ones. <laughs> the wings clipped them off. <laughs> anyway, put a little dent in it. All it did. Anyway, he uh I said, come on, let's go back flying. He says, no. I said, if you don't fly now, you won't never fly. you got to get back in a plane. So he said, okay. He rode his motorcycle over again, kept his helmet <laughs> on. <this time. laughs> 
And we took off, flew around, and come back. So <laughs> yeah, that's gonna help. <laughs> so what, what happened was when they did the annual lunar thing. Every <laughs> year they have an annual. Yes, a must. And if if they, if you fly, you got to have a. So uh, this plane was uh, probably twenty or thirty years old. Oh wow! Okay, but, but it's like every year. They have an Got to do the inspections, yeah. Anything wrong, you go and fix it before you can fly it again. Absolutely. Did they miss something? Mm-hmm. Well, w- when he put the magneto thing back on, there's two wires in there. One of them was not not in all the way, and it kind of shorted out. Yep, I got you there. But the other one would make it keep going. So. Right. Jeez. Yeah, it would skip around. Same thing on the sprint car, the magneto that we run on the sprint car. Mm-hmm. Same similar thing. Similar thing happened to me at Bridgeport. Yep. <clears throat> yep. Very similar thing. The motor started missing, and then the next thing you know, it locked up because the magneto just spun itself out, basically. And then it was because it's, it's a big ass magnet, basically, yeah. in there. So weird, weird yeah, time. Anyway, anyway, he he got he got over there, and we flew around. He landed, and he was all right. You know, he still you know up until the day he died, he did not like flying, and I think that oh. was from you. <laughs> no, he didn't like. It. I think it was from you. Well, the, the reason I I learned. The, Wanted to learn to fly is because I I I would not get on six foot step ladder. Height just bothered me. Really? Yeah. Wow. And uh, now I've been on almost any kind of ladder I go up on now. But yeah. Well, I used to. Not no more. I'm too old. Yeah. <laughs> you weren't affected by it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what the difference was. I was sitting on a plane in the plane, and I'd be up. To eight ten thousand feet in the air, it didn't bother. Nope, but you couldn't be on a six foot step ladder. I don't blame you. It's different. I don't blame you. I want to. I want to ask you some <clears throat> some questions because, um, <clears throat> I think this is kind of fun. Uh, so I went to Twitter. I, hope I think it's fun. I think you think it's fun. <laughs> Maybe who knows? <laughs> I went to Twitter. And I asked all my fans, I said, hey, listen, I said, I'm filming a podcast and interviewing my grandfather. What questions do you want me to ask him? Yes. Oh, yeah, boy. Hey, let me see. I don't believe that. <laughs> right here. <laughs> all right. Here we go. I don't, I don't work tweeter anyway. <laughs> tweeter. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the first question right here from Joanne Wesson. Says, my question is, what's your favorite memory of you and CJ together? There's a lot. Favorite. Favorite memory. Uh, is when you win one year dead's race. That was pretty spectacular. Yes, yeah. sir. It was. <laughs> yeah. And I, I watch it now. I, I bet I watched it probably 10 or 15 times. And you win every time. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy how that works, right? Yeah. I think you had it on this morning. I heard I it on thought, the TV. I, I, yep. I'm getting tired of seeing all, he winning every time. <laughs> Yeah, get a second once in a while, know, right? Damn. Oh, <laughs> no, that's pretty good. I like that. No, that was a good memory. But did, um, I mean, obviously, when in, you know, Dad had that big memorial race, and uh, you know, or Doug had that for for Dad. I thought that was really special. Um, I'm gonna touch on that night because that was like a that was a weird one for me. That was a really weird one for me. Well, you started fifteenth, finished first. And they're out of about 20 or 30 cars. Yep. Yeah, uh, and you didn't have field. but 25 laps on a half-mile track to get to the front. Yep. And I drove like I had a, a purpose that day. You did. You sure did. It was, it was kind of funny because everyone looks back at that race and they're like, damn, he came from 15th to, to win the race. Well, oh, two well, weeks in a row, I started wait. 18th and 17th and finished second. Like, we we finished second, I think it's three or four times in a row leading up to that race. Like, it was bound and, like, we were bound and determined to, like, just win one at one point. And yeah. that was that was pretty spectacular. Well, that was awesome. One of your biggest competitors. Hey, but now here's the thing. You passed him on the white flag. Yeah, I barely had enough time. One, yeah. one left, one lap left. Yep. Is when you pass them coming in uh, off of turn four. Yep, that's right. And then you pull away from them. Yep, took that last lap and yeah. walked away from it. And that was um. So 25, 24 laps, you were passing cars. Yeah, 
And you're the and best two, three fastest guys were always starting top four every race. Every race. Conveniently. <laughs> Never outside the top four, but we won't yeah. go there. And then you're 15. So. <laughs> Conspiracy theories Weird. over here. <laughs> All right. Um, so that was your favorite memory. I love that one. I'm going to go to the next question. All right, everybody, really quick. If you have not joined Club Motivated, go to your app store right now. It's $9.99 a month. There's a ton of stuff. I'm not even going to list all of it, but we're having a ton of fun on there. We're doing FaceTime calls with members. We're giving out like, dinners with me and you. I'm taking you all on trips. I'm doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So you're going to want to join that. Go to Club Motivated in your app store, install it, create a profile. We'll see you there. Now back to the podcast. All right, everybody, we're back right here. We had to take a quick pee break, all three of us. We have the bladder of a 93-year-old. Um... 93. <laughs> How old are you, Granddad? 84, right? 84. 84. 84. 84, the big 84. So we have a question from Amanda Nash, a Twitter follower of mine. Amanda says, ask him if he always knew you would succeed in racing and business, and does he think you will ever get married? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like question. the way he laughs. Well... Uh, yes, I knew he would succeed. He started when he was four and a half and uh, developed his career, and I thought he did great. But uh, it's it turned out that he rather race dirt than has to worry about the money situation with NASCAR. That's right. I knew I could make more money being a business owner and then enjoying what I race. Instead hey, of the other way around. That's smarter. I, I, I would never, what made me feel good is when you the guy warned you to run cup series and run about 10 laps and quit. Yep, start and park. Yep. Start and park, yep. But uh, are you telling him, hey, I've been racing since I was four and a half years old, and every time I get into a race car, I try to win the race. That's the only reason I get in there for it. Yeah, that's for sure. He was going to pay me good money on that deal, too. He was going to get 50% of the purse, which is a lot. I mean, even just starting parking like back then, it was a good amount of money. People mm-hmm. don't do it anymore, but, um, yeah, that was – I told him straight up. I'm like, nope, I'm good. Hey, you did, appreciate you're it. not doing that now. No, not really anymore. That's kind of going by the wayside with all that charter system that they have. <laughs> <laughs> Next question comes from Lynette Saunders. Do you have any regrets in life at all? Absolutely. Got it? Absolutely. You want to talk about them or no? You don't have to, but I mean, if you want to, you can. Well, there's no particular one, but there's a lot of things I would have, if I had to live it over again, would do it a lot different. Yeah, that makes sense. You make a lot of stupid mistakes, I probably would clean them up. You'd never learn if you didn't make those mistakes. True. You couldn't be sitting here saying that you, you know, you learned something, right? That's all that matters. No, <laughs> no he didn't. You learned something. Yeah. Well, that that's that's all that matters right there. Um, let's see here. Do you know anything about our family? Know anything about what? Like our ancestry. Do you know, like, what, what are we? I know we're Mediterranean. Italian. I'm, I'm Italian on mom's side. I think we're Mediterranean or what are we? I have no idea what the hell we are. French and English. French and English. Mostly French. No wonder I'm an asshole. The French are assholes. <laughs> quote, quote. <Yes. laughs> Dumb number. <laughs> that's, the, that's the reason for the dark complexion of French part. Yeah. Gotcha. So your last name is French. Faison. Faison. Oh, oui, oui. Faison, oui, oui. <laughs> Some bread and wine. Long, oui, oui. <laughs> hey, parlez vous français? See, the f did that wow. say? See, it's Spanish. Spanish. <laughs> oh, we, oui, we. Oui. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> oh, I blame man. Desiree for that one, but we won't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> Mucho gracias, amigo. We. Oui. And amigo. See. Si. Now that was Italian. <laughs> no, no, that, it that was Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> French. <laughs> no wonder why we have such a short temper and we're assholes, you know? Yeah. We're French. And then on mom's side, I'm Italian. So, like, you know, I, I got a short fuse on both sides. You you show it. So, uh, I got to ask you this. You don't show your short fuse. I try not to. I've been trained by very good attorneys on what to do in certain situations. 
Oh, okay. There's a reason why there's a six figure bill every year at attorney's fees for me. You better have the best ones around you. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, you know, talking about like uh, yeah, short fuse and all that kind of stuff. Like, do you are there was rumor. So, <laughs> pop up booth, hmm? heat pop up booth on mom's side. I don't know if you all knew this or not, but apparently he was like, there was always rumors that he was like in the mafia, but like I got like a weird confirmation a couple of months ago that like he was like deep in the mafia. Who's that now? My mom's biological father. Oh, I hadn't heard that, but oh. Uh, and then I heard something about you. I don't believe it. I don't believe he was. He's he was not I, Jerry. No, the other one. I'm talking about Donald because he had some wild dealings. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, he um tried to throw a man off the 14th floor of a balcony in Ocean City back in the 60s, apparently, because he didn't pay him. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, they probably made him mad. They did. He had a very short fuse. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's true. Were you in the mafia? Me? No. Sounds like someone, that someone in the mafia would say. That's exactly what I would say, too. No. Absolutely <clears throat> not. I, I was my own mafia. Oh. We don't have to elaborate. I know some <laughs> stories. Well, I, no, I was kidding about being in the mafia. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I was this way, though, during the auctions. They, uh, you always give terms and conditions over the auction, okay? And I always say, "I'll, t- I'll take you. I'll take you good che- uh, a check, cash, cash and check. But if you write me a check, make sure you got the money in the bank when I get your check there. Or." I have for, because I have no faith in the judicial system whatsoever. Amen to that. I will send my goons after you. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, if that's mafia, <laughs> I'm mafia. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds right. I'm like a real note though. Like how? Oof. Like hey, I had a poli- and I always had a uniform policeman at all my auctions. <laughs> that's right. He was standing right beside me. Love it. <laughs> when I said that. I love it. Was that like a real thing? Like when you were like in your 20s, 30s, 40s, like was a mafia something that people really feared at that time? Or is that just like folklore that you hear about? Did you ever have any like mm-hmm. inkling that mafia was around this area? No. No? Don't believe it? Mm-mm. I was my own person. He was his own mafia. Oh, somebody didn't mess with. <laughs> no, I, I've heard I, some I stories. never did. I had, I said that one day and it had a, a one of my regular customers standing there, and a newcomer mm-hmm. was in there. Newcomer looked at him and they said, He's joking, isn't he? And my guy that comes, all of them said, Don't write him a bad check. Bingo. Don't <laughs> write him a bad check for sure. But I've the fear of God, people. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard some stories. Well, that's, that's kind of <laughs> like when we first started this auction up here. Mm-hmm. I had a guy write us a bad check. And so, I won't name names, but we sent, we got in our rollback and went and started back in his best car on his lot. That's right. Y'all were going to take it. And now we're just going to hold it for collateral. Exactly. Yeah. You're going to take it for collateral. Yep. Yeah. He and, paid up, uh, didn't he? And then uh, he said, he come running out and Ron told him, says, hey, give him my money. He said, I hadn't got it. He said, okay, drag that on up there, boy. Started dragging it up, but he ran back in there and got the money and come back and brought it to us. <laughs> so I was talking to a, a, a dealer one day. He said, what do y'all do about bad checks? I said, we don't have any. He said, how is that? I said, and I told him the story. He said, now let me get this straight. I'm going to write <clears> you a bad check. And you're going to call the law. You're going to take my car. And I, I said, yeah, that's right. He says, I call the law on you. And I said, let me get this straight. I said, I'm from the South. You're going to write me a bad check, and you're going to call the law on me. <laughs> <laughs> Joking, of course. I don't know how much of a joke that is. 
Anyway. That's the thing. Like, these days, like, people got to be careful, like, running up on people. Yeah. Like, I, you, you, everyone's always Mr. Billy Badass until it really comes time to be a Mr. Billy Badass. And, like, your generation, you all settled stuff with, you know, violence. And, you know, obviously, of course, like, given the certain circumstances, you do have the right to defend yourself and stuff. But, like, you know... I've been I've been trained by attorneys that I pay very 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 good money for is never ever fight back. Let them do the fighting for you. Yeah, it's just weird how times have changed, you know what I mean? Like dad always told me, "Hey, you got beef with somebody, you go out in the streets and settle it with them." You know? And I've had some business deals where I've actually had to go after some people for some money. I had a guy hang me out for sixty four or sixty five thousand dollars one time. Wrote me a bad check for sixty four, sixty five thousand, whatever it is. Let's call it sixty four for the benefit of him. And like you said, I'm going to withhold his name. First thing that I did was I, I panicked. I'm like, this is a lot of money to be hanging out there. And I called him. He wouldn't answer. Wouldn't answer. Wouldn't answer. So I drove to New Jersey. He wasn't at his dealership, so I said, okay, no problem. Looked up his home address, found his home address. I went and knocked on his door. I said, hey, man, you remember me? He's like, yeah, buddy, I was coming down to see you, all this kind of stuff. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure you were. I said, let me ask you this. I said, how do you want to settle this? We can either settle it one or two ways. You either pay me and we're straight up, or I said, I'm shooting an email and a text message or whatever I got to do to my attorney and it ain't going to be pretty because you wrote me a bad check over a certain amount. And when you write that, we're technically an automotive dealer. That's felony. a felony. Felony. It's a felony. What? And that's, that's why it's very, very important before you go try to jump somebody from behind or it's very important before you write somebody a bad check or do somebody wrong, you understand what the hell you're actually doing wrong. Don't be an idiot. We talked we talk about consequences. Bingo. You be responsible for for what your actions do. Amen to that. Yep. And like, uh, you know, again, I've got the very best attorneys that you can possibly buy. And they're they're there for a reason. Because in today's society, you need them for so, everything. Yeah. Undisciplined kids going around thinking they can do whatever they want. But they'll pay. Yeah, I, yep. got a, I got a granddaughter as an attorney. Yes. <laughs> and she, hey, now listen, she is ruthless. Like she's in uh, North Carolina. So she handles like all kinds of, I, I don't know if I can really get into what she handles. But like, okay. I promise you this. She could get in an argument with a telephone pole and I swear to she would win. I don't know. <laughs> she's pretty she, good, huh? What she, she's the, well, oh, man. She's uh, in her final exam in college. They have to, they have fake things, you know, and say, okay, this is a situation. You got to present it to the court system. That's right. Yep. And so the, she, she presented her thing. They use the same ones every year, but she she presented hers, and she's a, and the judge it was a lawyer acting as a judge. Call her up to the stand after it was over with, and says, "You, I've been doing this twelve years, and we use this thing every year. You're the only one that has ever won the case." <laughs> wow, it's pretty good. She's ruthless, brother. So she, she <laughs> she's good at what she does. She's she's over a, a region, the five regions, four in North United States and one in Canada. She's the head lawyer for all that. It's crazy. She's wild. She found her calling, which is good. A lot of people don't find wow. it that early. No, nah, a lot and of people miss the boat. You know, she she's found what she was truly meant to do. I mean, truly. I mean, she's she is she's ruthless. <laughs> hey, she's very level headed. Very. Have to be. Yep. What um I'm gonna scroll through these questions real quick. Um all right. This is kind of a open ended question, kind of like a multi part question. So Kelly Smalley eighty six on Twitter says, What was CJ like growing up? That's the first question. <laughs> oh gosh. Well, he's very <laughs> possessive. And I say that jokingly. Because mm -hmm. he was told where he walked out to the in front of the house. And somebody told him that was his tree. And he's standing there, and you asked him what's going on. He said, this is my tree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and he he believed it. Not much has changed. Nope. That was very possessive. <laughs> it's like well, the same thing. I'm I'm still like that over all my stuff. I mean, think of the, about the, my race rig. Nobody drives that except for me because I'm very possessive over well, my stuff. I think that's pretty smart. Yeah, you're probably right. Or when that dude looked at your girlfriend a couple weeks ago. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Everything. I guess a guy wants a lawsuit, too. Um, <laughs> was he as crazy as he is now? Yes. <laughs> Jeez. Don't even, think even yeah. hesitate. Yeah. I'll, say yeah. now, I'll say this. I believe he's a little less now. Not much, but uh, he's got so much going now, he don't have time for junk. And when I say junk, them phone calls he called me about, that's junk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do it as often now, do I? No. <laughs> got him yesterday pretty good. <laughs> you don't have time. Um, how has CJ changed as times changed? Yeah, I think you change with the times and using it to your advantage. I like that. That's a good answer. I'll pay you later. <laughs> <laughs> you know it wouldn't take you much. I know. <laughs> oh, if man. I, if I don't earn it, I won't take it. That's exactly right. Um. All right, let me look here. Let me look. I got one for you while we're sitting here waiting. Um, what is one thing at this point in your life that you've not done that you want to do? Whether it's the simplest thing or like the traveling across the world. Like, is there anything that you just like, you're still like, I need to do that. Are you pretty content? I can't, I, I can't think of anything I really want to do now. So you lived. Yeah. It's awesome. I think I've done. More than I should a lot of times, <laughs> but I think I was I've handled it pretty well. <laughs> that's awesome. And damn, that's that's deep. It is. When when you can be eighty four years old and you can be content with what you've done, I think that's I think you're I think what you are or where you are right now in life is a lot more than most people can say. Most Over. people get to your age and they're like, Man, I wish I would have done X, Y, Z, one, two, and three. No. Well, I've done a lot of things. I'm, I was president of uh, the North Carolina Auctioneer License, uh, North Carolina Auctioneer Association. Yep. Wow. I was president of the National Auctioneer Association, Hall of Fame yeah. in South Carolina, Hall of Fame in North Carolina, and Hall of Fame nationally. Yeah, it's that's huge. pretty big. That's, that's huge. Awesome. Un unexpected on my part. <laughs> unexpected no i think um you know i i i've only heard you auctioneer probably twice in my whole life right yeah you run out those two times <laughs> no, <I did> not. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. no it's um <clears throat> you've got that auctioneer chant that auctioneer voice um that's something that i've never actually wanted to do was learn how to auctioneer you well, know? hey you in your you in your field you're in the old field. You don't need better auctioneer. Nope. You hire better auctioneers than myself. That's the way that I have learned well, to do things. I, I, I taught your dad this. Always hire somebody that knows more about their job that you're going to give them than you do. Bingo. Yeah. Hire smarter people than you. That's how smart people get smarter. In their field. Bingo. Do you think that there is anything in your life, what, like... Give me, give me like the most hot take ever, right? Tell me what the key to being married for 54 years is to the same woman. Deep love. Now, it's not a 50, marriage is not a 50-50 deal. It's a 20-80. 20 20-80? Yes. 20 sometimes, 80 sometimes. Okay. Same person. You got to give more than you take. Got it. Shoo. I've never know. heard it like that before, but that's no. the way to put it. Well, you got to have faith in your spouse, too, see? Yeah, I can see that. Then it's 28. Is that's, that for both sides? Both sides. Okay. Hmm. So when I'm 80, she's 20. When I'm 20, she's 80. 
It makes sense. Be there. And one thing we decided when we got married, started having children. If she does something or says something to the ch- children I don't like, or if I say something she don't like, we discuss it in private. I like that. Too many parents want to argue and shit in front of kids. No, 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 no. That's not the way to do it. You know what I think you uh, that I've learned from you probably the most is like the what? Nothing, bro. <laughs> no, 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 no. I've, I, I have learned a lot from you. Um, I'm, a, I'm an analyzer. I analyze situations all the time. And I, you know, everyone always wonders like why my parents got divorced. Well, dad workaholic mom wanted more time with dad no one ran around on each other or anything they got to the point where dad would not let up from work and mom wanted that family time and just couldn't do it anymore and exactly right and they gave up and if there's one thing that i did learn uh, i i looked at mom and dad's uh you know their marriage and everything was great except for like the last like three years of it and I got to witness that, you know, because I, I was going racing all the time. Brittany was horse showing all the time. And mom was at the horse shows and she was trying to bounce between races and horse shows and all this kind of stuff. And Well, your um, sister, by the way, won national. Yeah. Brittany was one of the best horse riders in the country wow. for she, like she five won, or six years. She went awesome. to a national competition and won it. Yep. Went to the Canadian Nationals, won that. Like she just, she would mop it up everywhere. Crazy. Like she was really, really good. And... I learned something through all of this. Like I, I analyzed situations and I looked at mom and dad and I'm like, all right, if they can't make it, why do I have faith in marriage? Right. Ah, it's not going to work. That's bullshit. You know? And then I look at you and Mimi and then I also, and aunt Rhonda and uncle Larry, they would never guess this, but I look at them too. And I'm like, you know what? They've withstood this test of times just like you and Mimi did. Oh yeah. And that there. I told her many it, times. It helped. She could have looked the world over and not found a better one. Yeah. <laughs> L- Uncle Larry is a saint. I love that yeah. man to death. Yeah. And I don't talk to him as much as I probably should or, or, or need to. Um, but I, I tell you what, the the girl that I have now has changed my perspective on things, and she reminds me so much of Mimi. It's odd. So much of her. Because, like, there's only two people in this world that can, or there's one person in the world that could keep you in check. And there's one person in the world that can keep me in check. Mm-hmm. Okay. I found mine. You found yours. <laughs> and I, that, you know, Mimi could, well, she, she'd snatch him up in a heartbeat. Ronald. Well, but now <laughs> I used to love that. <laughs> i tell you, it's, uh, let's see. Give me a second. I don't know how to say it. I'm trying to figure say it very diplomatically. <laughs> <laughs> Rhonda said to Lucy one day, she said, why don't you get daddy to do so-and-so and so-and-so? She says, why don't you do that? Lucy says, I can get him to do anything I ask him to, but I just got to pick the time. See, I'm out working. If, I'm, if my mind is busy, just like he did, he went to a doctor and they told him, he has, most people have one or two things they think about at the same time. He had four. He was carrying four things in his head and analyzing each one individually, which, you know, you, that's the reason people say something to you and you never hear it. Yeah. Yep. And I think that was one of the things that with your mom and daddy had the problem with. She'd ask him a question, he wouldn't even acknowledge she said anything right yeah. so. i get that way too like I, oh yeah because people ask me a question and like i asked you earlier and i'm like just focus on other things just yeah. focus on other projects yeah you but and me anyway, were an inspiration though but she's but lucy's told us that hey i can get him to do anything i asked him to she knew i loved her that much i don't care what it was yeah but she had to pick the time because if i'm occupied i could see that Probably yeah. not here. Yeah. Now, you you all were like an influence for sure, as much as you may or may not know. But like looking back, I looked at like uh, just the way that you two were. And then I look at Uncle Larry and Aunt Rhonda and I'm like, standing the test of time, man. Like those yeah. two, like I, 
I love, I am so grateful for my family. Like, I mean, if you really think about it, we don't have like that, like fucked up crazy family member out there. We're very fortunate. Help me. Get the hell out of here. (laughs) You are not crazy. No. (laughs) Like, you know, like the one that's causing problems at like family dinners. Like we always all get along. We don't put up with that. Yeah. Well, we, we all like. We teach you young. You're responsible for your actions. If you don't, you get your little butt whipped. That's exactly right. And I agree with that, hundred percent. See where all this comes from? Yeah, yeah seeing it now. But you know, some people say, "Well, that's that's child abuse." You, oh, I tell you what, I had Ron. I told you about him working in the restaurant. This guy in a white white tie, white shirt and tie and coat, come to the and he says, "Uh, I like speaking to the owner." I said, "Okay, come on. What do you want to talk about?" He said, you got a guy on the payroll that's underage. Now, he was like seven, eight. I put him on the payroll, took taxes out on him and all that, just like I'm supposed to. <laughs> he says, you're working him too many hours. I said, listen, that person you're talking about is my son. I will train him like I want him to be. Yep. Get your ass out of here and don't you ever come back. <laughs> He's seen him since. <laughs> now, if, if you train, you see, society is very forgiving. Yeah. That's the, one of the big problems. Yeah. Unfortunately, they are. Yeah. Well, I think America kind of like forgot where it came from, too. I mean, even looking back, you know, 100, 200 years ago, like just how America got to be what it is, this country like, that everybody was scared of. And yeah, like we used to be some bullies like we still need to be that way yeah if Teacher you're not kids. scared of us we're not doing our job yeah but now everyone gets like we talk about all the time participation trophies and no oh, poor you poor mm. this like you gotta toughen your kids up everyone's just too soft nowadays yeah they your generation definitely was like the school of hard knots and hey learn yeah i learned my father it was the easiest going person in the world until you made him mad yep He's going to whip your tail. That's exactly right. Because you didn't do something he said. Well, just like I told both of my kids, I was trained this way. My daddy asked me to do something or tell me to do something. Yep. And I didn't do it. He'd tell me again. He never had to go the third time. Absolutely. The third time is banging on something back here. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Not not brutally, but just, hey, I'm going to change your attitude right now. Bingo. Yep. It used to get old here. So I told, that's what I told my two children, your dad and and your aunt. I'm going to tell you one time. I was like, well, maybe you didn't hear me. I'm going to tell you again. But that third time ain't going to be telling. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Third time you're going to be feeling it. (laughs) Yeah. I I feel like we used to like, you know, like at least like growing up, you you hear parents tell these stories. Oh, back in my day. Up the, you know, walk to, walk to school uphill in the snow. Like, but now, like, I get it. And, like, I wish the world yeah. was, like, kind of like that because now it's just so different. Yeah. I mean, it, the world today is so much different from when he grew well, up. Well, parents aren't trained to kids. Correct. They, what they do is throw money at them, get them out of hair. Yep. I said that a while ago. No, but it's true. And you got to <laughs> teach, teach the kids how to work, and they're responsible. Or there's consequences coming. Yeah. Not necessarily whipping, but if you you shoot somebody and kill them, you're going to jail. Yep, bingo. Exactly. Is there anything that you would give me advice on? What's one thing that you would say, change look, this? Look, you have, a, you have achieved more in your 29 years than I have in 84. I don't have any advice for you. Wow. Damn. That's deep. Yeah. I'm very proud of you. I appreciate that. I do. I just told the world that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that hits deeper than anything else for sure. <laughs> that <laughs> means a lot, yeah. In fact, all my grandkids have out excelled me. And that's hey, and that's great. That's a good feeling. Absolutely. It's a wonderful is. feeling. Well, is is there anything that you could tell people listening to this podcast that you learned over the years that you think people need to like think about 
or just any simple thing that they should look at? Any advice? I just talked about teach your kids to work, and, and t- they are responsible for those consequences. That's right. I like that. No, it mm-hmm. makes sense. It's kind of short, sweet, simple, to the point, but like it's probably something that a lot of people should think about. I, I also feel that the world right now is in a, a, a very, very dark place, and uh, I, I don't, I don't know if it'll change. The rest of the world is a lot darker than the United States, but we're coming. Yep. It's getting yep. light. It's getting gray area. Yeah, there is. That's for sure. And also, um, for everybody watching, they this might be their first time that they've ever seen you. I mean, you've obviously been on one of my YouTube videos before, and uh, that was a really fun time. <laughs> I, I do want to ask you this. Do you believe in the paranormal? Like, I took you on a ghost hunt, and we had some rather weird things happen. Yeah. But... Do you believe in ghosts or you do you believe in just coincidences? And it's okay if you believe in coincidences. I, I just personally like to, I like to know. And, you know, dad, he was a skeptic. He was very skeptical. But then I took him on a ghost hunt and he's like, oh, what the fuck is all this about? You know? Yeah. What, what do you think? Well, I believe in it. I believe it. I tell people all the time, I used to work do your grandmother's hair, give her permanence and all that. And she says, and, I, and somebody asked her where she get her hair fixed, and they said, well, I did. And I say, I was a, I was a hairdresser in a previous life. Because <laughs> you were good at it, right? <laughs> yeah, I've been a doctor and a, and a hairdresser. <laughs> now the people think I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Probably been a comedian, too. <laughs> yeah, comedian was also in there, yep. Politician. Yeah. <laughs> Lawyer. <laughs> oh, a politician's the insult. <laughs> <laughs> well, back in the day before it was, okay. you know, it was bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's before, what I'm saying. If they are in a crook for to get there, they we won when they leave. That's right. <laughs> Some of them still haven't left yet either. <laughs> I know one from this state has been there. <laughs> uh, you're not wrong. <laughs> hey, it's, it's two things you don't talk to friends about. And that's religion and politics. That's right. That's we, that's another lesson that people need to think about nowadays. Unfortunately, everyone's a keyboard warrior right now. And yeah. Well, they don't have to look at who they're talking to. Exactly. They can hide behind a keyboard. Everybody's a, a Billy Badass behind a keyboard. Yeah. Yep. I like that expression. Yep. <laughs> well, what did you um? What did you think about the the whole trophy truck race that we did run to in December? We flew you out and we got to go. Uh, Race around the desert. How was that experience for you going to Vegas and everything? In the desert. Yeah, how'd you like that? Hey, hey, listen. I'm out there and I, and people ask me, says, we it's a two hundred mile race. How are you gonna watch it? I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there when it comes around. And then I get out there and CJ comes to me and says, how do you like helicopters? I said, I flew my own plane. I don't think, you know, I had never ridden in one. I watched a race in one. Uh, what was it that's, like? That's how you watch a race when <laughs> it's in the desert. <laughs> uh, that's pretty good, right? That's yeah. pretty fun, right? Oh, yeah. We, we did a lot of filming and all that stuff. That's pretty cool. So you liked it overall. The helicopter oh, yeah. was cool. Oh, it was great. That's it was absolutely awesome. great, especially when you roll the thing four and a half times, and it's still laying on the side. <laughs> and he's panicking inside. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Different guy. But see, well, I didn't, I didn't see it until later. Right. But when they, they radio back something about you had just rolled it. And my question was, are they okay? And the answer was yes, so. Yeah, but that, that was that truck's built like a tank. I mean, you could drop it from space, and I think you'd be pretty okay. <laughs> yeah. You'd have a concussion, but you would be okay. <laughs> well, 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 me, you had your, your navigator was trying to get out your side before you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Damn yeah. right, I was. How about that, Chris? That's like a dog that's been locked in a cage the for camera, three days. The camera showed him trying to get out. And, you know, trying to noodle my way out. Hey, the the four hundred mile race now. You didn't roll it, but what, twice? Mm-mm, no, we just rolled on our side. We we got we caught a sand trap, and it just rolled like that. Just a half? Yeah. Well, maybe the next one you won't do it at all. 
Maybe. You went from four and a half to a half. <laughs> exactly. And in two races, so you got a lot to look forward to. You know, I, I think one of the things that most people don't understand about that off-road racing is finishing the race in itself is like finishing top three in any yeah, big, like, like It's the, like finishing top three in NASCAR or dirt track or something. Like you did something worth writing home about because it's such a tough race. I mean, such a big difference between dirt track racing and off-road. And I'll never hate on dirt track, but I will say dirt track is by far a much more enjoyable experience and way easier because you're not getting, you're not in a paint shaker for eight hours straight. Well, you, <laughs> you're, you're right. You're fucking right. just like you're, you're, you're getting you, the hey, hell beat out of you, dude. You're, you're in a, a vehicle running fast and it is like a unpaved anything. Not a oh, road. Yeah. Nothing's manicured and groomed on the track. It's rough. It's and it's not even a track. You're following a line on a GPS going through the desert, not knowing what's a hundred feet or you know a hundred miles ahead of you. And then, I mean, think about this too. You know, the Delo or the East Coast Hater Club uh, is like, oh, CJ rolled that trophy, flipped the trophy truck four times. Guess what, dumbasses? There was more trucks upside down than there was right side up at. Every event, you look at any of any of the fast guys, they have wrecked some shit. Because if yeah. you're not on that edge of out of control every fucking corner, you're so far in the back time wise, it's not even funny. Well, and you go and correct you're the time. Thirty mile an hour should be running a hundred, right? <laughs> and and, that, and that's run the thing. Thirty mile an hour, you wouldn't roll one. Exactly right. And if you're not pushing it out there in the desert, like mm -hmm. it's one thing. I, I I joked around about this. You know, you've seen me race circle track my whole life, right? I've never done anything off-road. I've never done anything crazy or anything wild like this off-road stuff. I go into this with an open mindset of I want to expand my driving abilities. And I never want to be known for just, oh, he just raced, you know, NASCAR for a few years and he raced dirt track and that was it. I want to be known as the guy that tried different facets of racing and yeah, like, I'm I'm obtaining like those well, skill the, sets. The builder, you know? the builder of the truck said that you finished the race and they didn't expect you to. Exactly. When yep. We finished the mint. I was actually talking the, to Chuck this morning, and uh, he just rookies. did the San Felipe 250. And well, it's a shorter race, but a, a lot more guys finished that than the mint. But the fact that we finished the mint with the, again 60, 70, 80 percent, you know, attrition rate. Crazy. We don't give ourselves enough credit for that. We still have to drop our podcast about that, but yeah, we should, we need to be patting ourselves for the mint because that was huge. That was a that was the roughest time well, you, of my entire life. You finished the two hundred yeah. mile race, and you finished the four hundred mile. In the four hundred mile race, had uh, eight times the amount of vehicles, race vehicles. So, like the the course through the desert was just so just whooped out. Like it was, it was as bad of terrain as I have personally ever thought anything could go Survival. through. Yeah. But like, yeah, you know, that's the thing. Is well, like people, you finished, people uh, don't understand it. You finished eighteenth, wasn't it out of a 49 in your class. And then will we finish 30th, then you overall? Finish 30th overall out of 600 race vehicles and then, or yeah, 500 and race vehicles. And you finish 34th or something, 30 yeah. something out of how many? Almost 500. 500 vehicles racing. Yeah, that's so pretty that, damn good. Hey, and that was your second time driving the race. Two for two. Yeah. I mean, just finishing those races is huge. I mean, a lot of the trucks that were on our team with Brenthal, they didn't end up finishing the race, which was pretty pretty heavy when you think about it. I mean, well, some of them lost wheels and everything else. Yeah. Flat tires. A, lo a lot of it is, is just that smart driving, but on the edge. And I, I had to learn was, where that edge it is. It looks like you stayed on it is because half the time you were airborne. Yeah, I know. <laughs> if you look at our truck, it's just wow, 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 wow. just but crazy. Your second race, then, we came then, around twenty fifth, our first lap, like that was, yeah. And, and you're running out awesome. there hundred mile an hour and three feet in the air. You don't do that on dirt tracks. No, it's art it's, watching the trucks move through the desert. It really is it's beautiful. It's an art of driving those vehicles. It truly is. Like I'm, I, I thoroughly mean this. Like those guys that race off road, their talent level is way above what anyone gives them credit for like oh, them, yeah. them guys are crazy like when i'm trying to keep up with these guys and and just figure out what the fuck is going on 
it's so tough because yeah. you have so much going on in that truck at all times. Like there's all that, like you've got to turn here, a jump there, a crest over hill. You know, you got to drop off. It's 25 feet. I mean, it's just like the most intense racing ever. And that's the reason they give you a navigator. That's right. And, and there's a, you know, a, a lot of the people on the East coast, like, again, they were like, Oh yeah. CJ flip, blah, blah, blah. People said it this weekend that your dad's race. Hey, yeah. I remember people like, oh, you guys got to keep it on four wheels. Yeah, keep so. it on four wheels. Well, guess who finished the motherfucking minute? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I like to give a little plug right here. Hit me. The Bridgeport racetrack. Yeah. With all that new dirt he's got on it, your brother-in-law and your sister have done one super job. They really have. They That's... really have, I think. They go, anytime that you can run on a half mile dirt track and run 200, I mean, 126 mile an hour on a half mile track now. Yeah. If they, somebody did something there the right. Yeah. Yes. He, he, Doug, I will, I will say this. Doug had a vision with that track and I'll never forget it. The first time that he ever told me, he's like, Hey, I'm going to take Bridgeport from a five eighths to a four tenths. I'm like, you're doing what? Shortening the track, which, you know, you know, rightfully so it needed to be done. It was just too big of a racetrack, but now it's perfect. The banking, all of that. Um, the facility itself is state of the art for the East Coast. It Absolutely. really is. You know, I mean, far is not superior much? to any dirt track I've ever seen, and I've been around. Yep. Yeah. Very nice facility. Um, the, the access that fans have, like, you know, he has me park behind the grandstands every week. And um, there's a sponsor of mine that, you know, obviously likes that too. And it's really cool because fans can come up to the back of the hauler. Like if you all ever come to Bridgeport, behind the grandstands is where my haulers park. So you all have access to watch us physically work on that car six feet away. There is like a little bit of a, a barrier. Um, but, you know, the, it's really, really neat. The and barrier, that's what I love. The barriers have changed. So you can see over. That's no problem. Yeah. You can see right there. Look in the back of my hauler. You can see how everything's done, how everything flows. And it's just, it's a really nice way to, to and, interact with fans. And between races, you get to come up and talk to you. Yep. Sure do. I spend majority of my time in between um, hot laps and heats and then the feature talking to fans. And uh, the, actually, it was Dad's memorial race. We had... Um, uh, I had a fan meetup basically. Oh yeah, and I gave away four. Was it four hundred shirts? Yeah, it was like oh, four hundred. I had four hundred fans show up, and I gave them all shirts. The line was all the way down the back of the grandstand. It was the, the most gate. <laughs> gnarly thing I've ever seen. Like there was people everywhere, and they showed up for Dad's race. And I'm like, number one, I I could have finished dead last in that race, and that meant more to me that fans showed up for me to support me at Dad's race than anything else like and then to go out there and win it and hear like the crowd literally erupting in the grandstands was one of the coolest things ever like that was the best feel-good moment ever and i will never forget that feeling and um it's a cinderella story and i like the part when the first thing you went was thank you lord yep that's it that was what you did yep it sure was so we were talking about dad's race and i'm just gonna preload into this um, when they dropped the green flag, the only thing in my mind that I had was win the race. Win the f race. Go out there, drive like I had some sense, and do my job. And one let the chips fall there where they fall. One thing that impressed me about that race, it didn't have but one wreck. One yeah, there was one caution. One caution. I believe it was one or two cautions. It's the fastest two. race ever. It went through, didn't it? It was quick. Out of 25 laps and 30-some cars, you had two yeah. cautions. That's almost unheard of. Yeah, it, it truly is, especially for our, you know, class of vehicles that we run. Especially for picking the fee, the winning fee. Yep. And it was, uh, I, I remember this. So the caution came out, and I have Chase in the infield, my crew chief. And yeah. it was... Um, I was looking at him because he'll usually tell me like, you know, hey, the top's working better than the middle. I'm not, I can't drive the bottom. If I had to drive the bottom, I'd hit every uke tire out there. So I, I'd rather just bounce it off the fence. And he was basically like, uh, go to the top. As, get as close to the wall as you could. He was giving me the hand signals where to go. So um, I started, I think it was six on that restart. 
and I think there was like eight laps to go. So I had to pick at least one off a lap. And then I got to the third position. And at that point, I had to, I knew I had to push the car harder than I've ever pushed it. And I did. Um, you know, uh, I think Mark Bittner, he made a mistake. Uh, I think he kind of just slid up high. He tried to throw a slider on himself. To, like he slid himself in one corner. And then um, Dominic got under him and all that. And then uh, Dominic makes a mistake. I'm right behind him. I capitalize on that. And I'll never forget this feeling. So we're going into three and four. And white lap. No, not yet. We were coming to the flag stand to get the one lap to go signal. And when we're going into three and four, um, I threw a slider on him. And I, for some reason, I did not follow him going into the corner the way I should have. What's the slider deal? So um, the people that don't know. So basically, it's where I go down low on the racetrack and slide up in front of somebody. Yeah. And it's a very common thing in dirt track racing and mainly in sprint cars. Yeah, I just, some people watching wouldn't know. Right, right. And uh, th so I threw a slider on him and I saw that he got into the fence just a little bit because he knew I was behind. Like, I don't know if he knew I was behind him, but he knew like he you can hear someone behind you. And I yeah. had my car wound up and he went in the corner kind of hot. I went in the corner kind of hot. I fucked up in the middle of the corner. He fucked up on entry and got into the, like the the loose stuff a little bit. Bounces the right rear off the wall like I do every race at Bridgeport and um, I capitalize on that one thing and I'm coming to the white flag we're coming off a of turn four and the white flag is out and I've never really explained this to anybody but on the white flag at, at that whole lap that white flag lap was the longest singular lap of my entire life and it felt like slow motion going in the corners but it also felt like I couldn't make any mistake I drove it you couldn't I drove it as hard as I could on the last lap. Instead of like trying to protect the car, I, I it was a last ditch effort for me. I it was either a make or break situation, and I would have rather wrecked on the last lap trying to win Dad's memorial race than to get passed again by somebody on the last lap. So, you know, it's kind of it's kind of a kick in the nuts when you get passed on the last lap. Uh, you know, and it would have it would have hurt that much more being Dad's memorial race and all that. So. I'm um, coming to the checkered flag, and it didn't even feel real. Like your whole body was numb. Well, and then when the caution came out, well, see you, you, uh, when he hit the wall, no, he didn't actually hit it. He just touched it. Yep. And you got in front of him. You walked away from him then. Yeah, but I, I don't know that in the car. I don't know that in the car at all. I could have took it a little easier on that last lap, but I didn't. I just went for it and well you were um, pulling away from him yeah it was a beautiful moment i didn't know that inside that you don't know it inside the car you don't know how far back somebody is or anything and um you know on the last lap a last ditch effort is throw a slider i mean a nasty slider i've done it before to people and you know it's worked out for me so why wouldn't it work for them too and as i came to the checkered flag through the checkered flag um i didn't stop until i saw the caution light come out because i'm like i'm not this up you know <laughs> yeah, the flagman could, make a mistake or yeah, you know, whatever it could have been the white flag <laughs> right you never know so um the caution finally comes out and uh you know slow everybody down and at that point it's like you turn these lights off in this room just poof, wave of emotion comes over you and then you realize what just happened you know you not only won your first sprint car race but you won your dad's memorial race with your first sprint car race and that was a pretty spectacular feeling because you were surrounded by so many people who, you know, who always believed in you and stuck by you. And, and I, I can truly say this. I've never had like, there's some family that doesn't really like support my like racing, which I'm completely okay with. But for the people who were there for that race, like it meant more to me than I could ever express. And, you know, you have been to every race that you could possibly be to. And, knowing that I made more than just myself proud at that race was, was everything. The moment that really got me and that really f***ed me up though for that race was when my sister came to the car and, um, she said something like, um, I'm so proud of you. And, and like, I could hear the emotion in her voice. And, uh, all I wanted to do 
was hug my nephew. Like that's all I wanted to do was hug my nephew Brady because he was so excited but confused of what was going on. And um, you know, the, she brought him around there to you. The coolest part was I got up on the wing and 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 Brady got to get up there with me, and that was the coolest. You know, I could have never won another race after that, and I'd have been completely content because that 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 moment was everything. Because I knew I, 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 it was a healing process for a lot of us, for you, for me. Um, it kind of sounds a little dumb, I'm sure, but like winning Dad's Memorial Race was like the first step for me to start to get over to losing your absolute best friend in the world. You know? Yep. Yep. That was a tough one. And, and, just, it, and it, it showed that you will continue to succeed without him. Yep. Yep, sure. Well, he trained me, trained me very, very well in life. Yeah. Just the whole week leading up to it. Well, you actually had to wait like months leading up to it because it got canceled originally because of the weather. Yeah. And then the race before that race, motor problems, Georgetown. Like that's it was just like yeah, threw everything at you. So that whole weekend was so stressful. Yeah. Well, you got you got a good crew that know what they're doing. Yeah, that's that's half the battle. Chases everything to that race team. I mean, it sure is like, you know, he's the heartbeat of the team, you know, <laughs> like I, I, I got the fun part. You just drive the car. <laughs> I, get, I get to drive the car. <laughs> now the unfun part is paying the bills, but you know, it is what it is. So I was just fixing to say you get to pay the bills too. Mm, yep. And that's, a, that's something I don't think everybody understands or realizes is, um, and, and not throwing shade on other people, but my dad does not pay for my racing. My dad hasn't paid for my racing since 2014. 14 was his last year of paying for my racing. Yeah. But, um, I, but again, getting back to this, um, you know, he trained me for success in whatever you deem success to be. Me personally, I, I look at success as like, hey, you know, what, what's the net worth now? Or, you know, what can I uh, afford to go do and, and enjoy before I die? Um, I've always had these weird premonitions. Yeah, you even want to stand up on the airplane. You gonna do that? <laughs> Stupid. I'm, I'm doing that. I'm doing that. Oh, you're not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you wait till I die. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's gonna be a long time. <laughs> oh, do you geez. do you think that you'll ever race another race that will ever mean more to you than that one did? Could you ever win anything that would be more special than that moment? No, I don't think there is. Even if I went in in his memorial race that's being rescheduled for this year. Let's say I go and win that, I, I I don't really think that it, it would mean just as much. But I could never I could go win the mint four hundred and it would not have I, that feeling inside of that personal gratification, I would not have I wouldn't get it out of that. Yeah, not even close. That first one on your dad's race was that you you won't never feel that way again. No. But you'll feel similar things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my I I grew up being trained uh, to, you know, eat nails for breakfast and uh, say fuck what people think, but also help out people in the long way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's really weird concept when you think well, about it. If I do, if I do what I think's right, and you don't like it, that's your problem. Bingo, hundred percent. That's that's Ooh, a, preach. That's, that's that one's that applies to ninety nine percent of world situations today. Yeah, for real. Yeah. People need to live like that. Yeah. Dropping wisdom. Man. This podcast got real deep. I love that. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> hey, it, well, the older you get, the more you really believe that. Yeah. But I, I like this because I'm going to be able to look back on this podcast and be like, damn, that was a good time. <laughs> you know what I mean? We talk about everything yeah. under the moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's still more stuff that we could cover in another episode or we can keep going now. <laughs> what, uh, so one of your father's favorite things he said is... In the restaurant business, I make I tell people what to do, and then I repeat it later on. Make sure they still you know, still emphasize it. And I was telling uh, telling them Lucy and him something about it. He, and, and my wife didn't understand. She said he, he said, "Don't worry, Mama. He's gonna tell you three more times before you do it." <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> I had so um. Good. I had a, I have a story about dad that I think you'll enjoy. You may have heard this or whatever, but uh, growing up, I was working at the auction and I was seven years old. And my, my only job was 
to be a janitor. Like I was a janitor at seven. It was the weirdest thing ever. And um, plunging f- toilets, don't have any clue what I'm doing, sweeping the lane area. Like, I mean, you know, a 15,000 square foot building at seven years old. That's a lot of square footage for your boy here. Okay. So I was struggling, struggling hard. And I would get yelled at all the time because I wouldn't do something right. You know what I mean? And, and He's trying to make sure you were doing it right. Bingo. So I'm seven years old. We had these big bullhorn speakers out there in the lean area and all throughout the property. So no matter where you were, Ron Faison could get a hold of you. No problem. So he says, CJ to the office now. And I could tell by his tone of voice. I'm like, I am so in trouble. Like, this is not good. I'm like, here it goes. I'm getting yelled at for something. I can't wait to hear what this is going to be about. And, uh, you know, seven years old, I go and sit in my dad's office. And um, he always, the way he, he was very, very, very calculated with the way he set up his office. So he could make eye contact with you when you're coming down the hall. So that way you knew what kind of mood you were getting. So I'm going down, going to his office. He said, shut that door behind you. So here I am, seven years old. Shut the door. Sit down. He said, did you do what you were supposed to do today? I said, yes, sir. I got the lane area all swept up, and I started cleaning the bathrooms. I'm not done them yet. I'm like, I'm you know, about to eat lunch here in just a little bit. And he said, well, he said, you didn't do a damn good job, did you? I'm like, no, the lanes look really good, I think. He said, you come with me. Walks me out there to the lane area, and there's a snack machine that's like raised up about six inches off the ground, and there was like one piece of trash, like a gum wrapper and like dust. And he says, you see that down there? What is that? I was like, oh, that's trash. He says, it's not being perfect. You're being half-assed with your cleaning. You do it right or you don't do it at all. End of story. He says, you want your job for the rest of the summer? I was like, well, yeah, of course. He's like, do you want to be paid next summer? I was like, yeah. He said, then you're going to work the rest of this summer for free so you can tell me just how much you want a job next summer. I mean, I was getting paid, like, I think it was like 20 cents an hour. I mean, I wasn't on the, I mean, he gave me like, you know, six dollars in the week or something. You're I was seven, like, I'm yeah. rich. Like, look at this. Like, I'm gonna go buy a matchbox. And um, he taught me how to work at a very young age. And then um uh leading up to that, so I was twelve years old and I had this idea in my head because I you know, I, I started businesses when I was eight years old. Like I was gonna make money at whatever age. Like I have always been entrepreneurship. That's the only thing I could ever think of. So I go to my dad and I wrote out a business plan on a piece of notebook paper (laughs) and I was going to go and sell tools and stickers to the car dealers at the auction. So he said, this business model is great. He said, but do you think people are going to buy tools every week and stickers every week? And I said, well, I think they'll buy stickers to put on the car, you know, like the number stickers that say the price or like down payment on a car and cold AC and all those little stickers. And I said, well, yeah, I actually think that they will. Maybe not the tools, but I'll have like certain things like I'll, the tag screws to put the, you know, the license plates on. And he said, all right. He said, you're going to need something to make more money than this. So I'm like, I'm like, I don't know what else I could do. So I pondered for like two days and I came back to his office that summer. I'll never forget this. Came back into his office and I said, I got it. I said, here's what we're going to do. I said, I'm going to sell popcorn inside my little tool trailer thing. <laughs> and after I sell the popcorn, I'm going to make, I'm, when I'm making the popcorn, I'm going to put a ton of salt on it. So everyone would be really, really thirsty. And then they'll go buy drinks from your drink machine, dad. And then you make money for helping invest in me. His mouth dropped to the floor. <laughs> I'll never forget it. <laughs> He's like, repeat that one more time. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to start making popcorn in my tool trailer thing or whatever. And, um, I I had it all calculated because I had my mom take me to Harbor Freight tools and I would go buy tools from Harbor Freight. And my plan was I just mark it up. You know, my business since at eight, nine years old just really wasn't where it needed to be. But I think I was like 12 around this time. So I just knew just enough. So anyway, I had all these price sheets worked out and like all summer long, I'm begging him. I'm like, please just invest like, like I think it was like $800, I need $800 to get like um, all these tools and popcorn and the popcorn machine and all that. And sure enough, his drink machine sales went up because I, dude, I don't know how people ate this popcorn. <laughs> Shit was salty as hell. 
<laughs> I just dump salt. But I convinced him to not just, I incentivized something for him to do so he could make more money as well instead of just having a handout. So every night he would come and he would count my cash register out. And I didn't make a dime for, I think it's like the first summer and a half until everything was paid back. But man, I was, I was always on the horn trying to make money. Always. It's still to this day. I can't stop. It's, it's like a sickness or something. Yeah. Weird. But yeah, that's how I got him to invest in my first ever business. And after that, he wouldn't invest in shit after that because he was like, <laughs> use your own money. Yeah. He said, you got your own money now. I was like, cool. This $300 I got is really going to go far. And that's the same thing with vehicles. I don't know if you remember how he used to be with uh, vehicles, but he loaned me $1,500 to buy my first car, which was this, um, I'll just say it as is. It was a shit box Jeep Wrangler. And I think I put like two or $300 in it and then I sold it. And I got to, I started flipping cars to where I had 4000 I had a $4,000 like Silverado and I paid him back his 1500 And then, you know, I've got a couple thousand dollars to play with. And I just flip car, flip car, flip car, flip cars until I didn't have to pay for anything. That's the same thing with my truck. I mean, I'm, you know, that's how I exchange trucks out now, but back then to get the car I wanted, I had to make money to do it. And it was just a, it was the opportunity through the auction, you know, yeah. find a cheap car, fix it up, sell it. That still works today. If you really are motivated and Absolutely. want it. Absolutely. I didn't yeah. want to do that. Do you have a favorite entrepreneurship story about yourself that you've done? <laughs> <laughs> mm. I, got, I got several of them, but I just, I just think I'll pass on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> got it. <All> right. <laughs> At the auction business, uh, in North Carolina, I had a lot of lot of fun. My theory was that you know keep people smiling while I'm doing the auction. I'd be making cracks. You know, if, if you quit bidding, I'd say, if I had your money, I'd bid again. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then yep. this guy and I, I said, if you will bid again, I'll ask him only one more time before he bids again. And then we go back. Yeah, I give you. <laughs> yeah. He just kept something going all the time. And uh, people ask me why I do that. I say, happy people spend more money with you. <laughs> Damn, that's True. a good point. Very if, you, if you're standing there like this. He, Not got, very happy, are you? you? You got your own idea for what yeah. you're going to do. Bingo. Mm -hmm. But if you're standing there laughing and all that, hey, he's crazy. Exactly. Ah, a couple hundred more bucks won't hurt. Yep. That's how it usually goes. <laughs> Well, that's awesome, Granddad. I appreciate you being on the podcast with us today. This was cool. A little last minute kind of, yeah. you know, get together. But I was a little nervous. I mean, you're good. Rightfully so. You got all these big cameras around you recording you. <laughs> you can hear yourself talk. I love that. Yeah, yeah I enjoyed it. <laughs> well, um, I learned a lot from you too. Though, so that's good. Well, hopefully you'll learn <laughs> a little bit more. And then if you all want Granddad back on the podcast, here's what we're going to do. We need you to leave a like on this thing. Comment below any question you may have for him. There's no question off limits. And uh, we will do like an unfiltered type podcast with granddad. I think we covered a lot of cool bases though. Like, I mean, life, a little bit of marriage and business and all that. Yeah. I love talking to you because I always get a kick out of it. All the fun times that we've had and all the crazy shit that we have done together. <laughs> it's like true. most people would be like, wow, you're only 29 years old and you've hey, done this much stuff I'll with your grandfather. I yeah. tell you, I took took him to the, the uh, golf course to the where you pitch your wedge and all that and hit and taught him how to play golf. And I'd say to him, keep your knees bent a little. And whatever I told him, he did it just like he's supposed to. But he he don't have time for that. <laughs> I don't have patience for golf. Let's put it that way. Well, well no. it's the most aggravating game you can play. That's a fact. <laughs> aggravating. I, I, you remember when I came and stayed at you or Mimi's house for a week and we went golfing for them two days? Uh, I'm going to tell you all this, okay? My grandfather ever invites you to go golf, just tell him no. I'll meet <laughs> you at the course at 9, okay? Because he woke my ass up at 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, it's dark out i'm like what are we doing <laughs> we're going the dark golf <laughs> it's dark out i said why are we up so early he said because we got to get to the green before everybody else and i'm hungry i'm like okay 
So stay hungry. I do too. <laughs> I get it from you. So we get to the golf course. It was maybe six o'clock in the morning and they're just starting like to serve breakfast. And there's three people there. Me, granddad, and the f- cook. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then people start to file in. Well, we were it was smart because we were done breakfast before they were even starting to eat breakfast. All them golfers that come in. Hey. And we started early and shit, we were at lunch next. Uh, hey, I loved it. I got a theory. Uh huh. My theory is if I gotta be late, I don't want to go. I like that. I'm gonna start missing a lot of events from here on out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be late. I like that. I like your theories. And those those likes you're gonna get, all three of them probably not gonna say too much. No, they will. Well, you better, you'd be surprised. <laughs> all three of them. You get that? Yeah. Careful what you wish for. All three. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Granddad, I love you. I appreciate you being on this podcast. I really do. It's been fun. And will you be on another one, if you don't mind? If, whatever. Yes. Okay. Whatever. Because you'll come back for Dad's rescheduled memorial race. And, uh, yeah, we'll have you back on again. This will be fun as hell. I like this. (laughs) Yeah. It's always a good time. (laughs) You always have something good to say. Yes, I'll be back. Whatever. Perfect. Well, We love you all. Thank you all for joining this podcast today. We really do appreciate all the love and support. Hit a like on this video if you don't mind. This was something really cool for me to do with my grandfather, with Chris, kind of bouncing some questions off of him. We will see you all on either the next video or the next podcast. Later, later. (laughs) 